Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kimberly Bertacci. Um, I'm a senior program policy specialist at uh, the NEA headquarters in the ESP quality department. I'm so excited to see some familiar names in the participants list uh, and to be um, you know, facilitating the session on the professional growth continuum, uh, what it is and how to use it. Um, I am joined uh, this evening with, with uh, Andrea Beeman. She is a special education paraprofessional in Maple Heights, Ohio. She is also the chair of the NEA ESP Careers Committee. Um, she does a number of things. Uh, she's also the NEA ESP Board Director at Large and also serves as a board director for the Ohio Education Association. So what we'd really like to do is we'd love to hear from you and see who's in the room with us. So we invite you to participate in an interactive poll. On your screen, you'll see a list of general job titles. Uh, please select by clicking on the screen which title best represents your role in your work site, school, district, or state. If you select other, please type your title or role in the chat box. So we'll give you a couple of minutes for a couple seconds, maybe. So it looks like we have a good number of ESPs, teacher, local association staff. So it's a good mix. Great, well, welcome. We are going to cover a lot of information tonight. So I encourage you to return to the recording when you have time to dig into the information shared that's most relevant to you. Um, we find it helpful to identify a few key concepts or major takeaways to listen for, take notes on, or just organize your thinking around so that when you leave this session, you'll have some specific highlights to share with others or use for your own planning purposes. So on the screen, you'll see that there are four main questions, right? Um, and as we cover the content of these questions, Andrea Beeman will provide personal perspective as a paraprofessional and examples from the field on why the PGC is a tool for organizing. So by the end of this webinar, you will know who ESPs are and how they contribute to school and student success. You will um, have an idea of what a continuum is and what the professional growth continuum is. Um, and then you also um, have some ideas about how you can use the PGC. So before we dig into the professional growth continuum, let's establish a common understanding. Um, in your district, school, or work site, you may use other terms such as classified staff or support staff to identify the people who keep schools running. Uh, interact with students, create the conditions for learning to take place, or support teachers and students within classrooms. The National Education Association identifies these staff as Education Support Professionals, or ESPs for short. Let's watch a short video and look for at least one takeaway on how ESPs contribute to school and student success. As we are pulling up this video, um, please note that in order to hear the video, you will need to um, turn up your uh, speakers, the, the volume on your speakers for your computer or your device. Um, you will not be able to hear it through the phone. And then once the video is finished playing, you will need to turn those speakers back down so you don't get feedback. Um, Great job, the Sophie. Thanks, Mom. There's an awesome team helping me at my school, and they include education support professionals. Like, whenever I'm on the bus, Mr. Davis encourages me to read. Officer Rodriguez cares about me. He keeps me safe. Mrs. Jackson is our office superhero. No matter how busy she is, she's always there to help. If anything breaks, there's nothing Mr. Wong can't fix. And Nurse Stevenson makes sure everyone is healthy. Math used to be hard for me, but now with Mr. Rushi's help, it's my favorite class. Ms. Jones feeds us hot and healthy meals so we have energy to learn. 
The school is spotless thanks to Mr. Decker. And he also helps me with my three pointers. Swish. Mr. Lee fixes the computers at our school, but also takes time to help students in need. Wow, it really takes a village to educate students. Yep. And since they help us from preschool through college, I can count on them for years to come. Education support professionals live in the communities where they work. They meet the needs of the whole student by keeping them healthy, safe, supported, engaged, and challenged. Learn more at nea.org slash ESP. Okay, um, so I hope everyone was able to hear uh, the video. Um, if you didn't, please ch uh, type something in the chat box and um, we, you'll be able to also go back and look at the video um, and after the recording is sent out. Um, some key takeaways from this video, obviously, that may seem small but really matter to understanding and communicating ESP value, I think, um, are that, you know, it really, it takes a village to educate students. They aren't just learning in the classroom and the teacher of record is not the only person educating students throughout the day. ESP's work involves creating the experiences and conditions for healthy, safe, supported, engaged, and challenged students. So the next few slides, I'm going to be posing some questions and I really would love to hear your perspective. So we're going to be asking you to type into the chat box um, some brief responses to the questions that are posted in front of you. So the first one is, um, how do you see ESPs contributing to student success in your school, district, or work site? And, and as you're thinking of ideas of what you might want to share with the group, I'd really love on um, Andrea to uh, share an example from her own personal experience as a parent paraeducator. Um, hello, everybody. As a paraeducator, a high school paraeducator, I greet my students at the door when they arrive at school. I attend inclusion classes with them and modify assignments, and I also serve as a job trainer. I work closely with intervention specialists to help students uh, achieve their IEP goals for reading, math, and behavior. Um, as a staff member, I work, I work very hard to establish positive relationships with my students and to help them cultivate um, other great relationships with their typical peers. That's great. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, and I see some responses in the chat box. The award says, by offering support to those who are serving, servicing face-to-face, -face, reinforcing student learning, listening to their issues and showing that they care, ESP secretaries greet and assist parents, good and difficult ones. That's from Helen. Thank you. Sandra Cunningham says they can set the mood for the day. That's definitely comes through almost all of the conversations that I have with ESPs and what I read about the connection between healthy, safe, and supported students. Um, the mood, the environment has a lot to do. It contributes so much to uh, the learning experience that students are set up for. Nia says, supporting student events and celebrating accomplishments. Judy says, ESPs are another trusted adult for students, an important member of the team. And Carrie says, building positive relationships with students. These are all great responses. Thank you so much. Making sure they're fed. Absolutely. Keeping it, having a clean environment. That's great. 
So um, I'm going to move on to the next question because I know that we can go on and on with that, with responding to this first one. Um, I appreciate that. So how did you learn how to do your job? Andrea, could you just share a little bit about your experience as a para educator um, and how that started? And so at the start of my career as a para educator, um, I learned how to do my job by watching other more experienced paraprofessionals. Um, I modeled their positive interactions with students and, and how they engaged with them in the classroom setting. And I really um, observed how they collaborated with teachers and administrators to, to go in and support the whole school community. That's how I learned how to do my job. Thank you. Um, what I love, what the, the words that stuck out to me when you were explaining your experience were modeling, um, observed, and um, observed how they were collaborating. And so those um, kinds of activities are, uh, you know, that is on-the-job training, and um, and it's it's a as we move through the rest of the presentation and we talk more about the professional growth continuum, you'll start to see that the continuum itself has a lot to do with these these theme areas of modeling, observing, collaborating, communicating. Some responses in the chat box, um, ESPs provide consistency. Um, by being a parent, then working with a one-on-one -on -one position along with taking classes, that's from Helen. Sandra Cunningham says, I learned what I do by watching others and finding educational opportunities to teach specifics. So more of the modeling, finding opportunities to teach specifics. So that takes a lot of awareness and observation, right? Planning. I see one person, two more people typing, and then we'll move on to the next question after we see what they have to share with us. I was just thrown into the position and had to figure it out through trial and error, says Gary Roberts. And we'll take one more from the chat box. Rohis says, I learned how to do how to do my job through my math teachers, not to mention the inclusion classes I had with my inclusion teacher in my first year of teaching. So you're really learning from your peers, right? Mia Ward says, I brought a wealth of knowledge with me to the position and was persistent in learning. That's great, Mia. Um, the next question is, are you currently learning and growing on the job? And if so, how, how are you doing that? Andrea, I know you have some thoughts to share about this too. Sure. Um, you know, our kids are, I'm, I'm growing in my, in my career because um, our students are 21st century learners, and I've had to use technology um, to help them with the current curriculum that we have. Technology is embedded into our curriculum, especially with the onset of high stakes testing. So I've had to educate myself about um, more use of technology, um, how to incorporate Google Docs um, into lessons, and just to familiarize myself um, with the things that our kids are learning and how to get them to be able to drop and drag and, and to be, in, be able to fill in um, those standardized um, tests that they give, you know, on the computers in the Chromebook. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Mia says, oh, wait, there's some typing in. Sandra Cunningham is typing.
Andrea, do, is there any other, are there any other areas of, of learning that outside of the technology usage and supporting them in that, that you, that you've experienced in terms of um, just your role as a paraprofessional? Um, yeah, um, uh, you know, dealing with, in, in my um, education community, we have a lot of students who are dealing with um, adverse childhood experiences and trauma. So I've had to really familiarize myself with um, making sure that, you know, our kids are in an environment where they feel safe to come and they feel and they feel um, safe enough to share what is what is going on with them. So, you know, I've had to learn how to um, program myself to come in and talk to a kid and you know if I in a and intentionally see if they're having a bad day. I need to, you know, to talk to them and see what, you know, help, what help they need and what resources I need to reach out to if I need to reach out to a school social worker or if I need to reach out to a guidance counselor or the school psychologist. Um, I've really had to retrain myself and to, um, to reteach myself to think about what is, instead of saying what's wrong with the kid, what happened to this child. Um, and so that's another way that I'm growing um, try, and, and just trying to help cultivate a culture and climate that's going to be that's going to be um, supportive to a student. That's amazing. Thank you for that. Um, Carrie responded in the chat box. She says, I learn something every day from my students and coworkers. I also attend conference institutes, uh, professional learning communities, and reading all sorts of material. Andrew Cunningham says, yes, I'm always looking for opportunities by attending conferences and other PD events. Okay, but so what I hear so much from all of you is uh, you are seeking out these opportunities and you are, um, you have a thirst for learning and supporting your students. Um, and that is an amazing, um, that's, it's amazing to see that and it's so appreciated. And what I, what, what it says to me also though is I wonder what, what it's like for the folks who don't maybe have the time or the thirst for um, for doing all of this on their own, and how should those folks be supported? Um, Mia says, learning more through AEA conferences and ESPLI training, also proactively facing challenges, seeking opportunities to, for growth and us and others as they become available. That's wonderful. Okay, so the last question. Um, that we have right now is, what do you understand a professional growth continuum to be? What does it mean to you, if it anything at all? And if it doesn't mean anything, type in doesn't mean anything. We'd love to hear that too. Those multiple attendees are typing. Andrea, do you have anything that you can share about what you first thought of when you heard of a professional growth continuum? When I first heard of the professional growth continuum, I thought, okay, this is going to be something that NEA came up that teachers are going to develop, um, and it's going to be made for ESPs, um, and so we're not going to really be able to get the full wealth of knowledge that an EFT would um, would be able to to grasp from from this document, and boy, was I wrong. That's awesome. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Mia says, uh, "Professional growth continuum to her is me learning and growing and mastering." Helen Wilkerson says, "I had heard about this from one of my board members last year." So I see some more typing, and I, I encourage you to continue typing and adding, but we're going to move on um, just so we can get through all the content. Um, so I wanted to ask all these questions because we really wanted to hear from you as we like kind of talk through um, some ways of um, seeing some of these terms um, um, from our perspective. Uh, a continuum is a series of events or changes that all have a particular quality to, to different degrees. So there could be a range of temperatures from freezing 
melting to boiling. That's a continuum. Or the seasons, events that are connected by change or development over time. Not one part of a continuum is better than another. So while there might be change or development, advancement over time, each stage is valuable and important in its own right. So what is a continuum? And so I love these pictures because the toddler, you know, being, uh, you know, being supported while he or she is uh, learning to walk up a log, and then this, you know, what looks like to me to be a professional athlete um, about to take off running um, in a race, right? What happens to the individual in between being supported to walk and being able to excel as a professional athlete running possibly? What happens in the middle? What happens in between? And the child in the middle, right, isn't supported anymore. The child in the middle is running um, on his or her own, and um, it's the it's the changes, the phases of growth in between that are are so interesting to what a continuum really is. So, what is a professional growth continuum, and why is it relevant? to you as ESPs or to you as a supporter of ESPs? Well, it's a way to keep track of and grow the skills, knowledge, experience, and responsibility you bring to your job. It also gives you the language to describe your value and contributions to your school, your district, or work site with peers, supervisors, and school leadership. So it's the language that explains and says to people, how you do your work, why you do your work, and who benefits from what you do. It serves as a guide for how you can advance your skill set to expand your professional goals. There are opportunities to lead, opportunities to mentor your peers, or serve as a role model. And it can also help you identify what skills you want to strengthen or additional training you and your peers might need to better serve your community, students, and schools. Over the last year or so, working in the ESP Quality Department, I've heard um, so many varied stories about the types of support or the lack of support and training that ESPs um, receive. And so one of the things that I think is so great about the PGC is that it provides individuals who might have nothing with examples of what might be possible, right? And with those examples of what might be possible, um, what we're hoping, right, is that individuals can then say, this is what we need. We need training on this specific topic and on these specific skills. With association support participating in professional development using the PGC, um, demonstrating mastery of skills and knowledge can be the evidence to negotiate for professional development pay, continuing education credits, or additional pay or stipends. Um, and there's many ways that, that that might look, how that can look, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the, in the presentation. So Andrea, as chair of the NEA ESP Careers Committee and one of the leaders who called for the creation of the ESP Professional Growth Continuum, could you try to provide a little background into why and how the PGC was created? Absolutely. Um, ESPs were yearning for, for a way to be able to um, understand how we do our jobs and what is expected of us. We were dying for professional development. And we need a guy. We needed a track. We needed a guy to help us do that. So um, the ESP Professional Growth Continuum was created out of a 2015, uh, 2015 new business item. And the NEA Accountability Task Force had two recommendations. They first wanted to deepen the knowledge and understanding of the roles of education support professionals and then design a professional growth continuum model 
for education support professionals. And this prompted the development of the, of the NEA ESP PGC. It's designed by the ESP for ESP. Um, the ESP Careers Committee got together and developed the standard, and we identified strategies for awareness and implementation. And then we got tons of ESPs from all of the career categories together, and we did participatory action research, and that was used to help develop the terminology and the, for the indicators and the descriptors that are found in the, uh, in the PGC. Great. Thank you. Um, and the, the web address on the screen in front of you is um, how you can access the, the professional growth continuum, the full document. So what is the ESP PGC? It is a set of universal standards, eight universal standards that cover the topics listed, um, effective work habits that cut across all career families to elevate the professional careers of education support professionals. These standards provide evidence of how ESPs contribute to the creation of a great public school for every student. So earlier we mentioned that the PGC can be used to learn how to describe and talk about the contributions uh, to your school, students, and work sites. As we watch this next short video, which is developed by NEA Alaska, we'd like you to listen for what ESPs are doing, how they're contributing. What do you hear or see in the video? And then please share by typing in the chat box at the bottom of your screen if you like. Um, and then we'll start this video. And remember that you do need to turn up the volume on your um, speakers to be able to hear. I'm the first one to get here in the morning, and I'm the last one to leave the building at night. ESP stands for Education Support Professional. Education support professionals range from nutrition service workers to custodians to the special ed assistants to tutor advisors. Others support administration in the offices and make sure that our schools are running smooth, that when parents come in, they have a friendly face to greet them. I could not imagine a world without education support professionals. I feel like are the glue. Our education support professionals know students differently, especially if they're working with them individually. They get to know them in a little bit different way than a classroom teacher might. And they can have a, an even greater impact because they can build those really positive relationships with kids. A lot of students don't have the greatest confidence. I want them to feel confident walking out into the world knowing that they can do it. I can provide it for them right now and try to help them through it, but I really hope that they go out into the world and be successful. My favorite part of the day is greeting all the students when they come in. That's one thing that we pride ourselves on is making sure that we know the names of all of our students and greeting them each morning when they enter school. NEA Alaska helps to fill in all the gaps of things that we need instructionally, um, but they're also on our side to make sure that we're doing what's best for the students, and in turn, that means what's best for us in our careers as well. My primary job is to make sure they have a safe environment and a clean environment. It's an incredible responsibility, and I look at it as, a, as really a privilege to have. I love working with kids, so this is a perfect job for me. What I see on a daily basis are teachers that would be overwhelmed with the student numbers that we have right now. We help build up their students so that they can focus and learn. My hope for the future for education support professionals is that they're recognized as the professionals that they are, for the value that they bring to our students every day and to public education. Great. I love that video. They actually just released that video a few um, 
a few months ago. Um, so it's a, a recent, uh, it was recently posted. Uh, some examples that I heard when I listened to the video for the first time this week were um, ESPs know different students differently. That stuck out to me a lot. They can have a greater impact because they can have strong relationships. Um, they want students to become more confident. They know the students' names. They greet them. They fill in the gaps. This is one that was really stuck out to me as well. Fill in the gaps instructionally. Like, what are those gaps? And how are those gaps created? And what's the best, they, they know what's best for the students. They make sure they have safe and clean environments. They support teachers by building up their students. So, what are these standards in the PGC all about? Um, in the document on the on our website, you will there's a um, the full definitions for each of the PGC standards are listed. But essentially, each standard can be understood by the following brief summaries. So the communication standard really is about listening and communicating effectively. The cultural competence standard is about um, thinking about your cultural context and that of others and interacting with sensitivity to differences. The organization standard is about thinking through and executing tasks effectively. The ethics standards is about maintaining a high level of ethical behavior, confidentiality, and privacy of any information regarding students, staff, and jobs. Health and safety, also knowing and executing um, procedures, protocols, health, safety, and emergency with fidelity. The technology standard about using electronic devices to problem solve and complete work-related duties. And Andrea um, actually mentioned that when she was talking about learning on the job and, um, and how technology is a big part of what she's doing in terms of helping um, her students. Um, learning those, um, those uh, um, processes. Professionalism, present and conduct oneself in a professional manner in all job settings. And so these are universal standards. They're standards of professionalism that cut across all nine of the ESP career families. So at, they touch the work of every single um, support staff professional. The standards um, are a continuous progression of knowledge and skill that build upon experiences, just like that picture that we saw earlier of the young child being supported, learning to walk, um, the young child running unaided, and then the professional athlete. Um, moving across the continuum means that an ESP is expanding their skill set. And I'll say that again expanding their skill set, becoming more proficient, and eventually advanced in their work over time. But as I said before, and it's really important to remember this, each stage of the continuum has, uh, is important and um, uh, in its own right, and no stage of the continuum is uh, better than another stage. So you can be in a foundational state on the continuum, and that um, there's nothing that can be taken away from, from being at that foundational state. Um, as you look through the PGC document, you'll find a lot of information. What matters is that each standard outlines examples of foundational actions that progress in the type of skill being done. So in the example in front of you on the screen, you see the progress moving from collecting and sharing information to managing information and then becoming responsible for the oversight of communications. The examples under each standard are not the only ways you might demonstrate the standard or see the standard practiced by your co-workers. They're just examples. So, um, so when you look at the document as you're flipping through it, what you should really try to um, hold on to is the standard itself, what the standard says. And then as you look through the examples, you might see examples of things that you do or your peers do, your coworkers do, 
Um, but it's possible that the, there isn't an example for something that you do on a regular basis, and, um, and that's okay, right? Uh, the, the standard can be applied and demonstrated in a variety of ways. And so um, we, are, uh, we wanna communicate that and the professional learning opportunities that we're designing right now um, are, are going to be done so in a way that we are able to add to the examples within the growth continuum and enhance them and create um, a, a larger document of, of examples for folks within each of the career families. So it's your turn. What does cultural competency mean to you? What does it look like in your job? And if you could just type that into the chat box for me, that would be great. Um, uh, just think about what I said earlier about cultural competency, which is cultural competency is the standard that uh, asks you to think about your cultural context and that of others and interact with sensitivity to differences. How does that show up in your work? You folks are typing in right now. One story that I was uh, I, I was having a conversation with a colleague um, actually earlier this week, and she was talking to a bus driver in Washington State, and um, that bus driver has is a career bus driver. She's been driving um, students for 20 years, and um, she's in a more rural part of the state. Uh, but there is a um, new refugee uh, population in that area, and so there are lots of students in, on her bus that um, have lived in, um, uh, not lived in the United States before. And, um, and so communicating with them has been a challenge, and, and so when she, when she was asked about the cultural competency standard, what popped into her head was something that might seem very small, and she actually said, it's, this is probably really small, and, um, and my colleague said, no, that's not small at all. It's a really big deal, and so what this woman has done is she has created this system where she's um, uh, learning words from the student's language, and then they're working on English language skills like every day on the bus, and um, and so that's a great example of what cultural competency can look like. Everybody's thinking because there's a lot of typing going on. And we won't stay too long here. But I just want to be able to read at least one of the, of the ideas that's being shared right now. Um, Mia says, in my position of human resources, I'm constantly communicating with sensitivity, sharing information, providing support, executing effectively with sensitivity, and enduring confidentiality. Matthew Powell says, it's understanding people and to be respectful and open to different cultural perspectives. That's right. Open. Respectful. Please keep typing because you'll be able to see what, you're, what everyone is, uh, was posting there. We're gonna move on. Um, the cultural competency standard is thinking through those, those cultural contexts, your own and that of others, and then interacting with sensitivity to differences. So um, this can look different depending on the role you have in your school district or work site. Some examples are just displayed on the chart. Right, so just like I, I was uh, mentioning in that example from the bus driver from Washington State, um, acknowledging the value of speaking multiple languages is a great example, right? Um, and another thing to consider is, you know, if someone isn't yet on the continuum, so if you look at the standards and, and for some reason, 
even the foundational examples don't resonate with you, um, don't be concerned. Um, many, maybe cultural competency is something that the district is focusing on because there's a need to take a foundational step. Um, or maybe it's not even the district that sees that as a need. Maybe it's, um, you know, you yourself and your peers think it's a foundational step that you think needs to be taken and that staff needs training to find ways to see and value the speaking of multiple languages, for example. If that's not something that's valued um, uh, and it's something that, that the community wants to value and believes should be valued, then taking a step towards realizing that is, is an example of using the professional growth continuum. So how to use the standards. In the handout section of the webinar, there's a short hands-on activity that we'll walk through in the next few slides that can give you ideas for how you might use the standards with a group of ESPs at a conference, local meeting, or an event. Um, so this is just one way of, of, of thinking about how to use the standards. So the first step is, you know, hosting a discussion group. Right? Host a discussion group of ESPs, either by career family or a mixed group. Have each member of the group introduce themselves, their role, and share one idea, opportunity, or issue that they're currently dealing with or want to address in their work, their job site, school, or district. Then, have the group really talk about what was shared and identify either a shared or individual goal, depending on the, on the makeup of your, of your group discussion. Maybe everyone wants to come up with their own individual goal. Maybe it's a group of bus drivers. They want a shared goal, right, for their district or their school. Um, and the goal should be what, what it needs to be for your own context, right? It could be based on similarities between the ideas shared or it could focus on an individual need. There's no right answer. It's whatever the right goal is for your community. The example I have here is in the next six months, our school's ESPs are vocal members of the education team and regularly communicate with school leadership on school and student needs. Third step, identify the universal standard that supports that goal. So, You've got your goal statement. You have your list of standards, communication, cultural competency, organization, reporting, ethics. Which one is best connected to it, right? For this example, I picked the communication standard. It could also be, and that doesn't mean that communication, the communication standard is the right one. There is no right one. Um, I could also see someone picking professionalism. Um, as, as, as an example of the standard that they want to connect. Then read through the standard and select one to two actions that are critical to achieving your goal. So you can go back to the document. So if you're having difficulty thinking, well, what, what does this look like? What do we need to do? Are there official opportunities for your ESPs to communicate with school leadership in the school? If opportunities to communicate exist, how can they be improved? Because not all cha channels of communication are, are effective. And if they don't exist, how do you create them? And so what I recommend you do, right, is then look to the PGC document, to those examples that are there to support you. Um, I pulled some examples in the foundational category of communication. And so maybe collecting and sharing information in a professional and efficient manner would is the action that needs to be taken. Maybe it's knowing expectations and guidelines for communicating around confidential matters. So maybe there's already a communication channel set up, but maybe, you'd, maybe everyone, maybe not all of the community staff members are, um, know what the expectations and guidelines are. And if that's the case, then that's an area for improvement. Then you want to describe as specifically as possible what needs to change about your school's context to take the actions you've selected or identified. 
Do your, does your school need a procedural document that outlines expectations around routine, sensitive, and confidential matters? Do you need to establish a process for collecting and sharing information? Um, or do you and your colleagues and coworkers need training on how to collect and share information efficiently? Is there not a process for that? Um, or is the process just not what's working best for you? Those are all the kinds of questions that we would encourage you to, as an ESP, to ask yourself and, and, your, and your colleagues. And then if you're supporting ESPs, these are the kinds of questions that we would want you to to um, use with them, to support them in thinking outside the box maybe um, of or um, uh, what might be possible. Another key step is identifying your champions, allies or supporters who can help you develop your growth plan. Because this example that we're walking through is just the, the first step in developing a professional growth plan. You really need to look inside at who you are um, and who you are in within your school community and um, and then you want to also look and see so who in my school or my district advocates for ESPs and would be willing to help me those individuals are critical to um, to, be, to being your champions and to and to helping you um, you know move forward with your with your professional growth goal So some closing reflection questions I've put here for just a small little activity that could be done in a 30-minute or 60-minute during a 60-minute meeting or conversation. Um, these questions can help you and your audience by clarifying um, what they're looking to achieve, what they want to happen, what their goal is, what the standard is that they've chosen, and is it the right one? What do they want to change? And who are their supporters that they can reach out to for, for next steps, which would be help and feedback on how to plan and how to move forward. So the initial exercises or steps I just shared are one example of a way into using the standards and starting a professional development process. In the PGC document that's available online, on page nine, you'll find a development process graphic, the one that's displayed in front of you. Um, this also can serve as a guide for professional development use. What matters in this process that you see in front of you is that there are some landmark steps that are very similar to what I just spoke about in that small activity. The first is looking inward. An individual ESP or group of ESPs takes a look at their personal work experience and local context. Two, there's a move into identifying ideas, issues, or opportunities for growth or change in the school district worksite or just your own personal job. And then three, the step, the step for the process is dependent upon connecting a standard and the action steps that will be taken to achieve the growth or change you're looking for. Just those three steps are the first, step, are the first base landmark steps for developing this process. And in this way, the PGC Universal Standards can meet the needs of ESPs where they are for what they need at the current moment. There is no right way into use. The standards are here for you to apply to your own unique role or position. Andrea, could you talk a little bit about the using the PGC, PGC as a tool? I, can, I sure can. Um, the PTC as a tool can be used as a self-assessment. It can help you sit down and really think about the professional growth that you want to acquire um, and to be able to chart your path into achieving that. It will also help you um, with your union and how to bargain time. You may be able to bargain time for um, uh, certificates of education, for certificates of education, educational units. Um, you'll be able to um, sit down with your district and give them this book to show them what ESD professional, good relevant professional development should look like. Um, it can also be a tool to use to help um, to ward off a privatization. Um, a great 
um, educated ESP um, ESP staff um, is is wonderful in the education community, and you can't deny the fact uh, when you when you are at the top of your game and your skills that no one else will be able to come in and do the job that you do to help support student success. Great. And then if you're an affiliate staff member, um, some ideas to reignite conversations on ESP support, professional development are listed on the slide. So you could create a board committee dedicated to discussing needs and creating opportunities for ESPs. You could have conversations and share what you've learned about the professional growth continuum to increase awareness and start thinking about how it can be put to use in your community. It could be used for bargaining or policy development. As ESP professional growth is acknowledged as necessary and essential, how it happens has a lot to do with the policies that are in place and the funding that's available to support implementation. So having those conversations Building those relationships is critical. Explore the use of micro-credentials to validate your ESP's knowledge and skill, and host maybe a learning community of ESPs to support them in their pursuit of an NEA micro-credential. We do have a stack of NEA micro-credentials um, uh, that are focused on the professional growth continuum, and um, you can access more information about that on um, the NEA Certification Bank website. The big takeaway here is that using the PGC to support the professional growth of ESP can strengthen the value proposition of union membership. This quote from Saul Ramos, he's a paraeducator and Brailleist. He's also the 2017 NEA ESP of the Year, just to me captures the essence of um, what we've been talking about. When we professionalize our careers, our students benefit. The PTC acknowledges this and empowers us to reflect on our current practices and our own our professional growth so that we're better supporting our students, schools, and communities. Why is continuous learning and improvement important for education support professionals? Because as I'm sure you can take away the the uh, goals of this of this webinar really it's because everyone who works in school is contributing to student learning in some way and should receive the training and learning opportunities necessary to achieve the mission of school. We might, you might have a different answer, so we encourage you to think about it, develop your own why statement, and use it in your communication with others. Before I turn it over to Jessica, who will wrap up and start the evaluation and question period, I would like to thank Andrea for the, her perspective and experience as she shared today. Please reach out to either of us with any questions or ideas you have about professional development opportunities for ESPs. We look forward to hearing from you. And on behalf of NEA's ESP Quality Department, we would like to thank you for taking the time to participate this evening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kimberly, for that session tonight. That was a lot of great information. Um, so at this time, we're going to open up the floor for question and answer. So if you have any questions, please uh, begin to type those in the chat bar now. Um, we'll just take uh, a couple of minutes just to do questions. I see some um, typing happening. Um, while those questions are coming in, uh, one question uh, for you, Kimberly. Um, can you tell us whether or not hard copies of the professional growth continuum are available? Where if someone wanted to, to um, get um, a copy of the PGC, would they, would they be able to get a hard copy or would they have to get it online? Um, so we have a few copies in the office, um, so not, we don't um, uh, uh, send them out um, in uh, mass quantity to folks. If you wanted to order copies of the PGC um, for, you know, more than five people, uh, we have forums online that you can access, and I'm not sure where I can put the links in for that. We have a link on our NEA ESP website where there's a form where you can um, order documents. But you can send me an email um, to kbertacci at nea.org, and I would be happy to send you 
a copy of the PGC, a hard copy. Okay. But we know those, those are limited in quantity because of Correct. how big they are. So, so um, because of the limited uh, limit quantity, what would be the fastest way for them to be able to get access to the information? Fastest way to access the information is going to the um, NEA ESP Professional Growth Continuum section of the website. And the web link is available to you um, just in the, the text box to the right of the, of the um, PowerPoint screen. And so from there, you can download the entire booklet or you can also um, you can download it in English and it's also translated in Spanish. And then there's also ways to just download a section of the, of the professional growth continuum for each career family. Okay. And um, again, if you have any questions, please type them now. Um, we do have one more question, um, and that is in reference to the assessment guide. Um, what is the assessment guide that's on the PGC site, and what is that, what is that to be used for? The assessment guide actually is a real, it's another great planning tool for how to um, initially start and start thinking about um, using the professional growth continuum. So um, it's also, there's a link available on that same main page, NEA ESP professional growth continuum site, um, and it basically walks you through a process. It's another example of a way into using the PGC. Um, there's steps uh, where you would be entering and co considering and thinking through your why statement. You would be selecting a standard. Um, you would be identifying um, there's some guiding questions that help you to establish your growth plan. Um, so it's another planning tool, and that's available on that main page. Okay. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions uh, further coming into the chat box, we are going to go ahead and um, end our question and answer portion of tonight's webinar. Um, again, thank you, uh, Kimberly and Andrea, for joining us this evening. Um, at this time, we're going to, uh, we are at the conclusion of our webinar. So on behalf of the NEA ESP Quality Department and the Center for Great Public Schools, we would like to thank you for taking the time to participate uh, in this evening's uh, session. Please keep an eye out for a follow-up email that will include a link to the webinar recording um, within seven to 10 business days. Uh, a link will also be made available on the NEA ESP PD Archives webpage. Please be sure to visit www.nea.org slash ESPPD to stay up to date with both recorded and upcoming webinar sessions. We look forward to connecting with you in future webinars. Thank you and have a good evening.